Hello everyone and welcome to this Apps Events and Google for Education Google Learning Webinar. My name is Rob McElroy and I am the Assistant Director at Young Hoon Elementary in Seoul, South Korea. Over the past six years I have become a regular speaker and trainer around Asia with Apps Events and I really love doing these webinars because I get to share the knowledge I have with G Suite with other teachers and I want to really show them how powerful G Suite can be. At my school, when we introduced G Suite, we first introduced it with our Western staff. That would be the first half of our school. But now the Korean staff is also using G Suite because they've seen how powerful and useful it can be. Also, last year my school was lucky enough to get uh, some Chromebooks for our upper grade elementary students and this has really changed the game for those kids. Before, when we had to struggle using technology in school, now with Chromebooks and G Suite, things are just so much easier. And also, these days, with online teaching and the trouble that that has caused a lot of teachers, using Chromebooks and using G Suite has become almost essential to having a class where you can monitor your students, help your students, and have your students get work done while still keeping them safe. So today, what we're going to talk about is project-based learning supported by Google Sites. So the first part of this webinar is going to introduce you briefly to what project-based learning is. And then we will build a site together, and I will show you how to use the new Google Sites to have students show off all of their hard work. All right, let's get started. So first, you might already be familiar with it, or you might not, but let's just go through the basics. The first question we're going to ask ourselves is, what is project-based learning? Project-based learning is basically a teaching method in which students learn by actively engaging in real-world and personally meaningful projects. Um, we're going to get deeper into this as it goes, but basically that's the, the, the kernel of what project-based learning is. And you can see down that I got most of my research from pblworks.org in the links there at the bottom of the screen. So if you want to get even deeper into what project-based learning is, please check out that site. It's a great resource. So first off, people have often confused project-based learning with projects. Now these are two different things and um, I'm going to use the analogy of food. So first when you think of project it is more like dessert. Okay and project-based learning is more like the main course. So what I mean by that is when you're doing a project, it's often a fun or creative challenge for students like doing a video, a poster, or a diorama, so it seems like a treat or a dessert. But what is really missing? Really, the substance of the unit is missing in the final project. It does not require deeper learning or collaboration with others to, to, to really show what they've learned. And it comes at the end of the unit, but is not part of the unit itself. Now, in contrast, project-based learning is more of a holistic a holistic pro a holistic project where the students are doing something in a realistic way so the project itself creates a genuine need to learn content and still skills to complete the task and we'll go into more examples in a second but in this case the teacher is more there to guide students and it, the teacher is more kind of a facilitator as opposed to a person who's just telling the students what they want and the students are providing it. So let's take a look at a couple examples and see if you can f figure out if they are project-based learning or a project. So in a high school math class, students are asked to do research on a famous ma mathematician and make a presentation about him or her. Is this a project or is this project-based learning? Well, if you guess project, you were right. Because the assignment doesn't teach the math content. It's not part of math. It's more of a, a, a presentation, a writing assignment. Um, so it's not really related to what they're learning. It's, all right, here's our next example. 
Um, students are asked to consider the driving question, why did civilizations fall from their golden ages? And what lessons can we learn from what happened? As they research various ancient civilizations, create museum museums to share their answers. Is this project-based learning or a project? This is project-based learning because they're focused on a complex question with no single right answer and it requires them to think critically. There could be many different answers to the question, why did the civilizations fall? So the students have to use their own logic and they have to apply what they've learned. All right, here's our third example. After a two week unit on the history of the 1960s that ended with a test, students spend two days staging a mock protest and hippie gatherings with costumes, props, and music. Is it project-based learning or a project? It's more of a project. The two-day event came after the students had studied the history of the 60s and was not the reason why they studied it. And fine, our final example. Student investigates how waste in local waterways contribute to the problems of plastic in the ocean. They propose solutions to the problem and present them to city officials. Project-based learning or project? This is project-based learning because the project has an authentic purpose and a clear audience outside of the classroom. Instruction and learning of the important science content is integrated into the project. So those are our examples. I hope that clears it up. But now we're going to talk about how to design a project-based unit, project-based learning unit. So to teach this, I'm going to teach you the gold standard PBL. And these are the seven essential project design elements that you'll need to design your project for your students. The first one is a challenging problem or question. The project is framed by a meaningful problem to be solved or a question to answer at the appropriate level of challenge. So you really need to think hard about something that is important to the students or meaningful to the students. And you also have to make sure that it's at the right level. If you go to that website that I mentioned before, they have tons of examples to help you out and to give you some good ideas on how to get started. All right. The second one is sustained inquiry. Students engage in rigorous extended process of posing questions, finding resources, and applying information. That means that the assignment doesn't just happen in one day. It should be something that goes on over one week or two weeks or even longer, where the kids come back to the question, they do some uh, discussion among themselves or with the teacher who's a facilitator, and then they keep on moving and they keep on learning and they grow like you would in a regular project if you're doing at a job or workplace. Okay, the next one is authenticity. So you don't want the kids to be just doing something because uh, it's in a textbook. You want to pick something that is important to them. Uh, if, for example, my students who live in Seoul, something that's important to them could be the air quality because that's something that they have to deal with every day or uh, how to improve traffic safety or how to remain mentally healthy in a very crowded environment. All of these things relate to them and they can understand, okay, this is something that's important to me, not just something I'm learning because my teacher tells me I should know it. So for every part of the world, these projects should be different. They could also be the same because we're all really the same all around the world, but everybody around the world also has some different challenges and some different things that they're dealing with. So your students should feel that this project is something real and not just something they're doing to get a mark. All right, uh, student voice and choice. As a teacher, you want to give the students structure and you want to give them maybe some examples on how to do things, but you also don't want to tell them that if they find an interesting way to present what they've learned or um, maybe they find an interesting question that they want to answer. You want to encourage them to have their own voice and to make their own choices. So you as a teacher have to be flexible and you have to figure out how you can evaluate them and also encourage them to go off and do their own thing. 
Uh, reflection. Reflection is also important in project-based learning. Uh, students and teachers have to reflect on what they're learning. Uh, this could be during the process and it could also be at the end. Um, at the end of each step or each part of the project, they should go back and they should reflect. Um, and then at the end of the entire project. So they should maybe be thinking about how they could have done better, what they did well. Um, next time when you run this assignment again, what are some other strategies that students can take? So the students can grow from this experience. So that's most important. I mean, everything a student does in school should teach them how to improve themselves and how to, um, how to achieve more. So you want the students to constantly be growing and constantly be um, improving and reflecting on what they learned. Feedback and revision. So you want the students to take kind of ownership of their project. So you could have groups that are doing the assignment, but you should also get um, feedback from the teacher. So the students can give and receive and apply feedback to improve their process and product during their assignment. And the teacher can also be uh, a part of this. And maybe even people in the community or, or people outside of the classroom, if possibly you can find someone. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a relationship with someone maybe in government and have the kids actually talk to someone who's in the field of what they're studying. That would be wonderful. Uh, it's not always possible, but you can you can definitely try. Uh, feedback and revision is always great because you want to teach the kids that you know it's not always a straight line that they have to follow to to finish their project and to achieve their goals. But there's going to be a lot of thought process and a lot of talking and a lot of going back and improving um, on what they're doing. Uh, finally, for the design gold standards, is a public product. Uh, that's kind of a keystone to project-based learning. You don't want these projects just to go to on a wall in, in school because that doesn't show the students that their work has really any outside value. You want to teach them that their projects are something that can make a difference. So you want to make sure that uh, the, their 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 product is published outside of the school. Uh, that's why today we're going to be talking about uh, Google Sites because it's a perfect way to put it out there in the world so people can learn and the students feel, feel that people are uh, taking stuff away from their project. Um, there's many different ways you can do this. So you could use also YouTube, uh, public videos. You could get the students to write um, to their local government and to present what they've learned. Um, hopefully the uh, government is smart enough to know that kids do know what they're talking about and could possibly make things better. Uh, they have some new ideas and um, yeah, it's just, you have to get it out there. You can't keep it in the school. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about how to uh, design a project-based learning unit and then also how to implement it in your classroom using the proper uh, guidelines and goals, we're going to talk about the example project-based learning unit that we're going to use today to build our Google site. So I chose this unit. Uh, this is a grade three unit. I chose grade three because I'm an elementary school teacher, so I wanted to be comfortable with uh, the material. And the title of this project is Tiny House. Now, the driving question was, how can we design a tiny house that meets the needs of our clients? So the students actually had to go and talk to real people and ask them what they wanted for their home. Now, I'm sure that uh, as in Seoul, Singapore is also the living space is at a premium, so people want to have the most comfortable home that they can, and they don't always have a large amount of space. So, in Seoul, recently there was a news story about uh, a couple who built 
a very tiny, I think, four-story home on a very small part of land, but it's a very beautiful home, very comfortable. So this is something that was in the news, so I thought, well, this would be something that my students could understand, because most of my students, or almost all my students, live in smaller apartments, so uh, building a tiny home might be something that's very interesting to them. So for this project, the learning goals and curriculum uh, were uh, in math, of course, area and perimeter, because it's important because you only have a certain amount of space to work with. And then also uh, language arts and English, because you're doing informational and opinion writing, and you're also doing um, nonfiction reading, you're doing note taking, and you're doing summarizing. So you can hit on all of those learning goals or curriculum outcomes with this project. So um, I decided, of course, that for this one, uh, one of the options you can give for the students to present their work would be to present as a Google site. Uh, you can, they can if they decide to do something different, of course, they can, do have that option. But uh, for this example, we're going to be using the Google site. And you're going to basically create a tiny house website that showcases their design for a tiny house and also showcase how they got there. So their clients can go to this website, learn about the process that the students did to get to the final design of the tiny house and then also look at the tiny house itself. Okay, so now since I've introduced our example project, light-based learning uh, unit, the tiny house project, uh, we're gonna get started in setting up our site. So this is where you're gonna learn all of the ins and outs of Google Sites and how to uh, show your students how to make a great site. So uh, you'll notice in my slideshow here, I actually do have, um, I do have slides for each one of these skills that you see on your screen right now, but I'm probably not gonna be going back to the slide deck very much. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to the site and build it. If you need a little bit of uh, extra support, you can go back to this slide while you're watching the video or after, and hopefully it has information that help you. So uh, let's get started on our site. The first thing you need to do um, you need to create a site. Now there's a few ways you can actually do this. You can actually go over here and you can create a Google site like you would create any other file. Um, that might be useful because then you can put it where you want in Drive automatically. You can also go to your app launcher here at the top and you see Google Sites. Or you can just type in sites.google.com and log in there. So you see here, we've got some options for uh, how to create a site. You can create a blank site, or you can create, um, there's a template gallery here. You've got a few templates to choose from, um, but I think what we're gonna choose for our example here is a student portfolio because it's meant to show off student work, or if you want, the students wanna make it a little bit more professional looking, they can um, create portfolio. But I'm gonna click on student portfolio here. And you can see that our site is going to be created. All right, so since this is probably gonna be a project where the students are going to be collaborating with uh, partners. We're going to share it with others first. We're gonna add collaborators. So when you add collaborators, you can um, change your um, settings here. So you can have your editors publish, change permissions and add new people. Uh, you can uncheck that if you wanna make it a little bit more secure, but the students that are working together should probably have the same sort of uh, same sort of privileges. So I'm just going to invite myself, and I'm going to invite uh, my school account as well, just to round out the crowd. And you can choose them; they can be a published viewer or editor. 
so you can choose what you would like them to be um, but we're going to pick editor for this one uh, and if you're sharing outside of the organization you can share anyway but probably you won't have this problem okay so now we have our collaborators added and we're going to name our website so we're going to call this tiny house tiny house PBL. Okay, enter. Now that's the name of the website. You have to actually notice up here, this is actually the file name. So this is the name that people will see when they go to your website, but this is the name that you'll see in your Google Drive. So I'm just going to call this PBL Tiny House Presentation. Site. Okay, and now if I open up Drive, you'll see that it is called PBL Tiny House Presentation Site, not Tiny House PBL. So you can see that this is the name of the website itself, but this is the name of the file. Okay, so um, you can choose to name it anything you want to make it easier for you to find it in your drive or to separate it from someone else's. All right, so the first thing we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at all the controls so that you can follow along. Uh, probably the most important area of the screen is over here on our right hand side. This has all of the things that you can do and add uh, you can also uh, double click with your left mouse somewhere on the website and you'll get a little pop-up that'll offer you kind of quick uh, shortcuts. But let's go over here first and let's take a look. So we've got insert and that's for all of your layouts and all of your items or widgets. Then you've got pages where you can uh, organize your pages. Uh, and then you have themes. So first, maybe we're gonna we're gonna look at themes, and we're going to change the theme. Um, I like impression. So when you change the theme, what it'll do? It'll change the font, and it'll change the color of the um, the site. So you can see if you change it to diplomat, it gives you another little feature. Uh, Aristotle changes as well. Simple. Um, we're, let's stick on vision. Okay, it's nice and simple. So now that we have uh, named our website and um, I showed you some of the uh, themes over here, I want to give our website a little bit more flair. So one of the things I like to do that's very easy is to add a logo. So all you have to do is go over here and add a logo and this settings will pop up and you can upload a logo. You can also select from uh, Google Drive, URL, Google Image Search, or Google Photos. So um, you see that I've created a, a logo here for myself. But um, I'm gonna show you how to make a logo in a really easy and uh, fun way. So one of the sites that I love using that's free is something called Flat Icon. Here's the website. And I'm going to just type in house, because obviously we're doing tiny house, so I'm going to filter it to make sure that it's only free. And I'm going to find something uh, that I like, something simple, logo should be nice and simple. So maybe I'm just going to pick uh, this one here. So I'm going to pick this one here. And you can download it as a PNG, uh, any size you want. So I'm just going to download that. And here you have to uh, attribute to your your um, your website to make sure it's free. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to download that. And to my website, I'm just going to insert that embedded code. So 
make sure everything is good. Okay, put that at the bottom. Okay, so I'm just, uh, I've got it downloaded here. Now I'm going to go back to Drive and I'm going to create a new Google Drawings. And I'm going to take it and drag it and drop it here. All right, now that we've got our logo here in the Google Drawing, what we're going to do is we're going to go down here to Page Setup. Uh, and we're not going to keep it in standard 4.3 or widescreen because with a logo, you pretty much want it to be all in one small space. So I'm going to change it to centimeters and I'm just going to make it um, 10 by 10, make it a square. Uh, you can see that the image resize. So I'm just going to make the, the picture a little bigger. I'm going to make sure it's in the center. You can go here, center page, horizontally and vertically to make sure it's exactly in the middle. Now, most logos, they, you know, usually are, um, they have like a, a round, they have a circle um, behind them just to kind of, that's how it, that's how Google puts it, puts it in there. So I'm just going to make sure that this circle's there. And I'm going to send it to the back behind this. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. I'm, trying, I'm going to try to fill the whole space. And what I'm doing right now is I'm actually holding shift while I drag so that the circle remains a perfect circle. Um, I'm going to maybe move up my house. And I'm going to change the background color uh, to something nice. Maybe a nice green representing nature. And I'm just going to put a little bit of text down here. So tiny house project. Uh, I'm going to resize it, make sure it fits. I'm going to go here, make sure it's nice and centered. And I'm going to change the font to something a little bit Older. I'm going to use maybe Oswald Bold. Uh, shrunk it down so I can make it a little bigger. Uh, it's not perfect, but I think you get the idea. So I'm just going to move this down a little tiny bit, just like there. Okay, so um, you can take as much time as you want with this, but I'm just going to take a few seconds. I'm just going to call it Logo. And I'm going to file, download it. Uh, you're going to want to download it as a PNG to keep that transparent background. So I'm just going to download that to my computer. Go back to my website. Click on Add Logo. Go to Upload. Should be in my downloads. There it is. Just take a second to upload. You, you might want to play with it to make sure that um, it looks good. And just put some alt text in case it doesn't show up. And you can also, it gives you a nice little option here. It actually finds the colors in your logo and allows you to use those in your, um, in your theme. So you can change the colors of your theme based on your icon. So if you want to have a unified color pattern, you can do it with this. So now you'll see that we've got a little logo up there and our start, our site is starting to take shape. Now that we have our logo, uh, the next thing we probably want to do is to work on our home page, our landing page. And probably the first thing that anybody's going to see when they go to your site is your header. So there's a few options. You can choose to have a cover, which is uh, a larger whole page, a large banner, regular size banner, or title only. Uh, I personally usually use uh, the banner, not the large banner. And if you go to the slide deck, um, Alice Keeler has... Uh, created a site where you can easily click on this uh, icon 
it will open up a Google Drawings template on how to make a Google Sites banner um, of your very own if you want to make your own. So first thing that you can do is you can click on it and you can click on change image. Now Google does provide some stock images uh, that are actually quite nice and there's actually quite a variety that you can choose from. But uh, personally, I like to usually create my own. So that's what we're going to do right now. So just again, all you have to do is click on this link here, and it'll give you a link to Alice Keeler's uh, website on how to create a Google Site banner. Uh, you can also search for Alice Keeler uh, Google Site banner, and I believe you'd be able to get to her um, get to her blog post. So once you click on that, what it'll do, it actually has a Google, uh, Google drawing that is the size of the large picture, the cover page. Um, so what you need to do is um, go to a site like um, Pexels, which has some free pictures. Um, and I'm going to search for homes and see what comes up. Uh, maybe I kind of like this one because this one looks like a nice, uh, uh, some nice little tiny home. So I'm just going to save that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert that image that I just downloaded. And I'm going to resize that image. Might have to stretch it a little bit. And what you want to do, uh, you'll notice that I'll move this to the back. You notice that this blue image here, this is actually what you will see if you um, are going to have the header type of banner. Now, if you're gonna do large banner, you're gonna make it a little bit larger, and cover is gonna be uh, the, probably the whole page. But if you just wanna show what's in the banner here, you wanna put your, your information or your picture in here. So I'm just gonna make it smaller, and I'm gonna send that picture to the back. It's a little bit squished, so you know I'm just maybe going to crop it a little bit, stretch it up. Um, you can add text at this point if you like, but I'm just going to save this. I'm going to download as PNG, go back to my Google site, I'm going to change image and upload. And now you see that it fits fairly nicely. You might uh, you might want to edit a little bit, but it, uh, it actually does a pretty good job. And you notice down here, this is readability. So what this will do, this will make sure that your text is easily read um, when you uh, add a new picture there. So it just makes sure that the text doesn't get lost doesn't get lost. So that's a quick and easy way to, to make a, um, a static image template for your banner. Now that we have our landing page set up with our custom banner, maybe you want to have your students do something a little bit more um, dynamic, a little more movement. One way to do that is to use a um, animated GIF or GIF to uh, then become your banner. So what I like to do, I like to go to, um, I use Giphy personally, and I have found that searching for Cinemagraph and Perfect Loop gives me some really nice images that I can use for um, these banners because they perfectly loop uh, over and over again. So they look really good in the banner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to 
uh, copy the source icon or the source uh, link here and I'm going to go to the source and I'm going to right click and I'm going to download the source and I'm going to rename it clocks so it's easier for me to find then I'm going to I'm not going to use uh, the template the banner template because the only options to download here are PDF uh, JPEG PNG or SVG and if I download in those formats I'm gonna lose my uh, ability to see the uh, animation so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my site and I'm gonna click change image and I'm going to select the GIF that I chose and you know it looks pretty good you might want to change the header type here to large banner and you might want to remove the text um, it's up to you uh, you can put um, anything you want here and um, I just think this adds a nice uh, a nice background um, got a few others that you could choose from so I could go back here and I go back to Giphy and I find something maybe nature and I'm going to go to media source again paste that link into a new tab save this image call this ferns and I go back to my website and I can go to chain image and upload ferns and this one might scale a little bit better because there's no central image to the uh, to the uh, to the GIF, and um, that's a nice easy way to create a moving banner in your site. So, just adds a little bit of character to the site. All right, now that we have added our animated uh, banner, we're gonna just add a little bit more uh, detail to our our site, and we're gonna add something called the favicon. Favicon is, is what shows up uh, when you bookmark a site or over here in the Omnibox, over on the left-hand side. Um, you'll see like uh, Google, um, Google Classroom has their logo and so does uh, slides and all these things. It's just a visual way for people to, um, when they bookmark your site, to see what it's about. And you can get there in a few different ways, but I just went here, I went over here to the uh, logo section. Now the favicon should be something simpler than your logo because it's, it's very, it's going to be very, very small. So uh, what I did is I went to a website called uh, Emojipedia.org and I just typed in home and I found a very simple uh, like open emoji here, I'm going to download this. It's a very simple uh, icon and it downloads as PNG and all you have to do is go to your favicon and you upload the file that you just downloaded. Now this file should be very small. If you try to pick something too large, it might not work. And now when you bookmark this site, you'll get that little icon either on your bookmarks bar or up here in your Omnibox. It just adds a little extra um, information, I guess, for someone who is uh, who is looking at your site. Next, we're going to want to uh, start adding pages to our site, so we're going to add more information now that we have our landing page set up. Uh, so, adding pages is very simple. You just go over to your right-hand menu and you click on Pages. And you'll see we have a home page, and there are some you can duplicate the page if you want to keep uh, if you want to keep the work that you've done on this page and just maybe add to it or modify it. You can um, check out the properties. Um, you can also, if you'd like, you can add a sub page. Now, um, sub page is uh, about uh, nesting pages, so that you don't have as many things across the top. So I'm just going to add a page here. And you'll see there's two options. There's new page and new link. I'll just, uh, I'll do new page first. So I'm just gonna click on new page. Now here you can just simply type um, research. 
uh, you know, and click done and you'll have a page and you'll see across the top you've got over here now you have a menu, you've got home and you've got research. Uh, what I also like, you can also uh, change the type of navigation. You can put it across the top if you'd like, like this. You can have them across the top. Uh, the, if you put them on the side, it's a little more compact. So if you have a lot of pages, you might want to do that. It's up to you. Uh, another way that I like to make it a little more visually pleasing, so I'm just going to put it across the top, and instead of just having the words there, I'm just going to open up the emoji Pedia again, and I'm going to type in research. Let's see what I get. All right, I got microscope. Uh, maybe I'm going to put in magnifying glass. See what I get there. Okay, so I got a magnifying glass. So that might be a good icon for research. And all I have to do is copy. And I go back to my site. And on research, I can um, click on properties. And it brings up the title. Now I can put that icon right up there. So now I have an icon to go with my word. Uh, possibly this would be a good idea if you are um, going to have this website in a place where maybe everybody isn't a native English speaker. Maybe like my school where the parents don't all speak English fluently. Uh, this would just be a visual cue to help them figure things out. That's uh, uh, one way to kind of just add a little extra to your um, to your pages and your, your navigation up here. Um, another thing you can also do, uh, I'm gonna add another page here to research. I'm going to duplicate the page. I just wanna show you uh, how to nest pages. So I'm just gonna use research. I'm gonna change this to uh, maybe graphs. Now, I don't wanna have research and graphs together. It takes up too much space. So all you have to do is drag it over top of research and now you'll see that research has a drop down and, and I can add as many pages as I want there. So that's just a nice way to kind of nest things and, and hide things and keep them um, nicely organized so they don't get uh, out of hand. Now, you know, if you find you have too much stuff across the top, you can always go and do side and it cleans up your website really nice, but you still have a drop down menu here where you have your nested pages within the top page. So you can have a top page and then you can have nested pages. Now, say for example, uh, you found you, you already had a website set up or you want to link to another website. So um, I'm going to find a, a website right now, uh, Tiny House Research or Tiny House. Um, blueprints. So I'm going to see here, I'm going to find, okay, um, maybe I want to link to tinyhouseplans.com to compare my project to uh, what other people have done. So all you have to do, you, you can include this in your website by copying the, the web address and then here you add new link instead of new page. So I click on new link and I click done. Tiny house plans. And now you'll see that in, it's just here. It's just like another page in my, in my web page, but it will open in a new, um, a new thing. And it'll give you a redirect notice so people know they're being sent to another website. But it's just a, it's a good way for people to add uh, a linked page to their website. Okay, now that we have some pages set up here, we can start to insert some information and in some, uh, some of our research that we've done for this project. So one of the ways that I suggest using, um, using the uh, features of Google Sites to organize your information is to choose layouts, to try to find some layouts that best suit what you are trying to put in there. So for example, 
maybe I, at the top I want to put a picture of a, a, a house that I'm building and um, and I uh, and I and I want to put some text beside it. So I'm just going to maybe pick. Uh, Let's pick a picture of uh, this house here. It looks like uh, it's as good as any. And you'll notice here that it will try to kind of, um, it will try to fit best to the format. So some things that you can do, you can click on crop. You can change the size of the image if you like. And you can also uncrop it to get it back to its natural, natural um, proportions. So I'm just going to write example here, and to add some text, I'm going to use this neat little Google uh, add-on called Lorem Ipsum Generator, and it's just neat. You can um, create as many paragraphs and as many sentences as you like of some, you know, just nonsense language, just as a placeholder. So I put that in there. So I've got a nice, a nice layout. I don't have to go over here, drag in draw a text box and then do a title and then do an image it's all ready for me so you can see there's different kinds of layouts as well there's ones with two pictures there's these ones here that you know have more and um, you know that's just an easy way quick and easy way to get all your information laid out so that's a good way to get some pictures and text into your document and your site and to make it look nice all right, let's take a look at what is below the layout section. So once you have, uh, once you've put in all your pictures and text, there's a whole mess of other things that you can add. So the first thing we're going to look at is collapsible text. Now collapsible text is great when you want to add some information, but maybe you don't necessarily want to take up too much space on your page. So I'm just going to probably put in uh, floor plans. And I'm going to create a um, three paragraphs of text. I'm going to add that in here. And you'll see once I click out, there is an arrow that allows me to uh, open and close that so that it um, just stays kind of uh, more hidden but still accessible. So it's just a, a nice way to put some information but not have too much text on your page. Maybe image carousel. Image carousel is just a nice way to uh, put some pictures out there. So I'm just going to click. I'm going to click on. Um, I'm going to go to my drive, and I'm going to go into my folder for. Hang on one second. My folder for this uh, this seminar, and I'm going to just click a bunch of pictures. I'm going to add them all. It's uploading them all to this carousel. And once it's all uploaded, I'm just going to get a image carousel that I can move and put into the middle to make it a little more aesthetically pleasing. And I can also click on the gear and I can pick the settings. You can have dots, captions, auto start. Um, so yeah, so it'll just rotate through the images without uh, anybody having to click on them. Uh, you can also add buttons. Buttons are great for social media, for um, navigating. Uh, you can put buttons at the bottom of the page. Uh, you can uh, link to other pages in the site. You can link to outside links, uh, whatever you like. So I'm just going to put on research. And I'm going to link to my research page. And you can see you've got a nice little, you can do outlined, you can do text, you can do filled, and there you go. So that's uh, buttons. You can add the buttons at the bottom for some easy, um, some easy uh, navigation. You can also copy this and you can... Um, Sorry, not copy. When you when you go to copy this page, it would copy to the bottom. So you can have this all throughout your website, whichever way you like it. Uh, placeholders. Uh, you can use placeholders for uh, if you maybe are having some trouble with some formatting and you want to have a picture move a certain place, you can put a placeholder above it. You can insert uh, YouTube videos. 
You can search for YouTube videos. And let's see, um, so you can just uh, search for a video or you can um, put in your own videos from uh, Google Sites, it's up to you. And you see when I move it around, you see how it does that blue uh, line? That just shows you where it's gonna drop it. So you can see you actually have quite a bit of options of where you'd like to drop it. But I'm just gonna drop it down here. Uh, you can also uh, put in a calendar if you like. You could put in a Google Map. Um, you can also insert some documents if you like, some from your drive. Well, it just inserts it. Make sure your sharing is set so that uh, people can see it, to view it outside your domain if you want to make it like that. Uh, Google Slides, you can add a presentation if you'd like. So I'm just going to add a let's see, tiny houses. I think I had one. Yeah, tiny house presentation. You can insert that. And so you see, like, you can just go back and you can add a text box above it. So if you want to describe what it is, you can double click, add some text, presentation. Uh, you can choose what kind of text if you want to have a title. And you can drag it where you'd like. So I want to have it there, right above. And then if you want to add some text to it, you grab the dots there, you can put it beside. Or above, or below. And you double click there. I think that'll work better. Yeah. There we go. So it's where I want it now. Okay, uh, the final section that I'm going to be talking to you about today is how to uh, use this embed feature of Google Sites. Now this embed feature um, is extremely powerful and it can really add a lot to your website. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna create a new page here and I'm just gonna call it embedded. And on this page, I'm just gonna show you a different, couple different types of embedding. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna embed um, by URL. URL is probably the simplest way to do it. It is not the um, cleanest way, but it usually works and it might be the best, it might be the first way that students learn how to do it. So what I'm gonna embed first, I'm just gonna go to Google Hot Trends. And now for Google Hot Trends, this website, there is no option to embed with HTML. So I'm just going to make sure I've got it set on, um, maybe I'll put it, I'm Canadian, so I'll put it on Canada, see what's going on in Canada. And all you have to do is take this URL, go back to your site, click embed, drop that in. And you'll see you can do whole page or sometimes it gives you an option for just content, but in this case, it's just whole page. And you'll see it just drops the whole page in there. Now for Google Trends, it works great. Other sites, not so much. So next I wanna teach you about how to embed with HTML. Now when you're embedding with HTML, there's a couple different um, things you need to know. And um, basically, the first thing I want you to know is that when you embed with HTML, please be careful of um, uh, some add-ons for Google uh, Chrome. Uh, they sometimes interfere, I have noticed they have interfered with some add-ons. Um, but if you're finding you're having trouble, what I suggest is open your site in incognito with no add-ons to your Chrome and see if you can get it to work that way. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to this website called flip5html. And I'm gonna sign in. I should sign in with my Google. All right, so you see here I've signed in and I've got this PDF book um, that uh, 
is got this flipping feature and it's a great thing if you've got a PDF document you can add a really nice um, feature to your site so I'm just gonna go to library and I'm gonna go to sorry I'm just gonna go to my bookcase and I want to I can embed my whole bookcase if I want so I just look for this embed feature and you usually see it uh, it's different on every site so you just click on embed so I'm just gonna go to my flips over here and you can see that I've got this tiny homes brochure and I just click on oops sorry um, to click on my more options and you'll see that it's got embed every websites different it's different places so I'm just gonna go and I'm just gonna click and I'm gonna copy this HTTPS now some sites give you both options for HTTP or HTTPS both should work but if they don't try one over the other and see which works for you and I just go over to my site here and I click embed and I'm not going to do by URL, I'm going to click on embed code and I'm going to drop that in. Now if it works you're going to see something like this, you're going to see uh, uh, processing and then you're going to see this edit code. So I'm just going to insert this the way it is. You can see that this actually wants to be a little bit bigger but when you're on a site you can actually pick the size so I could have picked a smaller size and it might have embedded smaller if I wanted to make it smaller but in in Google sites you can you can drag it and make it bigger and that is a way to embed some material now some other sites that are great for teachers to embed material uh, Padlet is wonderful if you go to Padlet you can see that you can see that there's a ton of options of stuff that you can do so you can make a padlet you can do a wall canvas stream grid shelf back channel map or timeline all those wonderful things that you can add um, cospaces.edu is a website that i've used now cospaces is great because it, you can do um, 3d drawing in it and then this is another one here. This is called Awesome Table, and it allows you to create some amazing, um, amazing uh, visuals from Google Sheets. So this is another one you might want to check out, but uh, probably don't have time today to check it out. So I'll just leave these here. There's links on all these images. You can also uh, you can also input uh, embed. Uh, Twitter, you can embed your own Twitter, you can embed a hashtag, you can embed following, any sort of thing like that. Um, yeah, so these are some sites that work great with embedding. There's a ton more, uh, just see what works for you, and uh, they really add a lot of uh, a lot of value to your site. All right, now we are almost near the end. Now, uh, very important to project-based learning is to publish your information to the world, share it with the world. So what we're going to do is we're just going to look at how to publish your site and also how to review before you publish. So uh, once you're ready to publish and go live, you click on Publish. You have to create a unique URL, and you can see that uh, the URL is actually um, is actually uh, connected to your probably your school domain, and you have to be careful with who can view. So, if you want to make it for the world, you have to make sure that so publish site. You have to make sure it's public. Now, check with your board, check with your school to make sure this is okay. Uh, maybe you might have to get permissions, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, make sure that your settings there are public so that everybody can see. And I'm just going to give it a unique name. I'm going to click on Publish. So you, if, it, if that name is uh, available, you've got a check mark. I'm going to click on Publish. Now the first time you publish, you won't get a chance to review with um, an old version. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to add a, uh, I'm going to insert a picture here. I'm just going to go to Google and I'm just going to type in graph. 
Insert that. So now it's different than what I just published. And I'm going to click on over here and I'm going to, there's this review changes and publish. And what it'll do, it will show you what's different. It'll show you how it's different. This is what's published over here on the right. And this is a draft of what you will be publishing. So once you're happy with the draft, you click on publish again. And then that will be what is actually live. And you can go over here and you can unpublish. And if you want to view published sites, It'll take you there. Now, what I usually do, just to make sure that my um, settings are correct, I go incognito, and I make sure that everybody can view my site, because if you don't have the settings set up right, it will ask you to log in to your school domain. So if you wanna make sure that everybody can see the site, make sure that your settings are correct, use incognito. I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming out to this webinar and I hope everyone enjoyed themselves and had a good time learning. See you next time.